we just kind of gave the overview of what we want to do with this uh, peace project. It's an idea we had several years ago. And what we want to do is just kind of roll this out now without the complex infrastructure and everything, because it seems like the world needs some uh, a dose of peace because of all the constant news around the uh, pandemic situation. So that is what we are doing here. It's a three part series. This is number two. And in this series, what we're really looking at is a little bit more of the technical stuff around heart math and particularly the biology of heart coherence. That's what I want to talk about today. We're going to have some slides. So just kind of an overview of what we did before. We talked about how there's been lots of TM studies over the decades. There's been sort of worldwide mass meditations over decades led by people like Deepak Chopra and Greg Braden and James Twyman and Lynn McTaggart. Those things are, are just really compelling. They work. You've got millions of people coming on and it literally changes the collective. It changes the Earth's magnetic fields. There's boosts in Schumann resonance. So there's a lot of evidence for that. We're going to talk more about that part, the global part, in session three. Today, I want to focus more about the brain and your heart and heart coherence and what it exactly is heart intelligence. Without further ado, I'm just going to go for it. This session is obviously very different from the first because we have more of a webinar style than a meetup uh, style, which you may be familiar with if you've been in other Zoom sessions. So you see there a slide biology of heart coherence. This is session two of the Virtual Peace Project series. So benefits of heart IQ. I kind of alluded to those in the first session. You literally improve your brain power because you're creating a, a, a more coherent brain, increasing mental clarity, cognitive faculties, intuitive skills. You stimulate relaxation, calmness, serenity through the parasympathetic, boosting physical immunity, which is very important right now. The times we live in, a lot of people are afraid of getting a virus, but this is good at in any situation. And sleep quality is also a biggie too. You sleep much more calmly when you're kind of in a heart coherent state throughout the day. Now this idea of heart uh, intelligence has been around uh, since ancient times. We've got uh, the people of Babylonia, Egypt, Mesopotamia. They felt that the heart was the primary organ. We think it's the brain nowadays, right? Uh, neuroscience and cognitive science. I myself am a, a, I'm a student of, of cognitive science but they never talk about the heart. And here's a, a well-known proverb, proverb, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, she. As a man or woman thinketh in his or her heart, so is she. We're being politically correct here. Kabbalah, the heart is a central sphere touching all 10 other spheres. And in yoga, heart is considered the seed of consciousness. You have like this inner guru inside, right? It has a lot to do with your heart that those intuitive impulses, that, that gut instinct, that feeling of what it is that I should do or not do. We won't talk about the gut brain, but that is also very important too, the so-called microbiome. And Chinese medicine, the heart is considered a bridge between the mind and body. And it's interesting with, with uh, acupuncturists, if you've ever been to one, they put a lot of importance on the pulse. There's dozens of different styles of pulses and they can tell very quickly what your state of health is and can tell a lot about you by looking at your tongue and by looking at, by feeling your pulse. And they have terms like slippery pulse and static pulse and things like that. I don't know what they call them exactly, but there's different names for uh, the pulses which they detect and they know what it means. They know what the correlations are. So Chinese medicine understood that. They even have a bunch of characters that have to do with the heart, that connect all these different topics that we're talking about. So facts about your heart. So this is some of the biology. Our heart is just an incredible organ. It beats 40 million times a year. That's nearly 3 billion pulsations in your lifetime if you live an average of 70 or 72 years. Just think about that. Your heart is this fascinating, incredible piece of biological technology that keeps beating throughout your life somewhere approaching 3 billion pulsations. We just take it for granted that we've got this amazing heart, this amazing brain. The heart pumps two gallons of blood per minute through 60,000 miles of vasculature. Think about that. 60,000 miles of vasculature in your body. The heart is considered autorhythmic. What that means is it starts beating in the unborn fetus. And this is even before the brain is formed. So this again speaks to this idea that the heart is in 
intelligent in and of itself, aside from the brain, right? Its own unique form of intelligence. So there's this autorhythmic capacity that we have, uh, and we see that with the unborn fetus. And the timing of the beat was thought to be controlled through the brain. However, after heart transplants, you can have nerves severed and your heart is still functioning. Brain and the heart. So a few more details about that. Here's the interesting thing. So we have a brain in our head, which is about 80 to 100 billion neurons, okay? But it was never thought that we had anything approaching neurons in the heart. And yet they discovered that uh, back in the 70s. And so it turns out there's at least 40,000 neurons in our physical heart. Neurons are supposed to be something that are found in the brain only, but they're in the heart. This is the so-called brain in the heart. There's also neurotransmitters and hormones and support cells. We call them glial cells in the brain, but there's a version of that in your physical heart. So there's a little, literally a mini brain in your heart. So this is the way in which the brain is able to communicate between your heart and your uh, head brain and also different parts of the body. So you've got a two-way communication stream going between the heart and brain. The heart signals influence uh, structures in the brain, such as the amygdala, the thalamus, the cortex, where we have the higher functionings. Th thalamus has to do with the sensory processing and filtering. And the amygdala, as we all know, is to do with your emotions and also fear responses. It turns out the heart can veto signals from your brain, whereas the brain obeys the heart. What, the, what that means is the heart has its own unique intelligence. And if you're operating more from a heart center, sometimes the heart knows what to do better than the brain because when we get stuck in our mind, we don't always make the best decisions. So the, the heart has this ability to sort of veto what's coming from the brain. It can override the brain as it were. And that's very interesting in and of itself. So those rhythmic beating patterns form an intelligent language. We'll be getting into that a little bit more when we talk about the four different ways in which the heart communicates the body. There's not just uh, neurons and hormones or electrical signals and hormones. There's actually a whole bunch of other stuff going on. So let's talk about the autonomic nervous system. I mentioned this in session one, and this is important because it governs a lot of processes in the body to do with the organs. We've got the so-called parasympathetic system, which you see on the left and the sympathetic on the right. And essentially they kind of have virtually opposite functions. So if you're looking there at that diagram, you see the sympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system will dilate the pupil, whereas the parasympathetic constricts. The sympathetic accelerates heart if you need it to, if you're running from a difficult situation, your fight or flight response, whereas the parasympathetic slows the heart. The sympathetic system, so if you're, quote, the, the example everyone gives is running from a lion or some wild animal, you're not gonna be wanting to digest food at that time, so you're inhibiting the stomach and the intestines, whereas the parasympathetic is activating the stomach and intestines. So you can see what, what the implications are. If you're in a stressed out state, you're basically inhibiting the appropriate uh, processes with digestion, and so you're not digesting food well. And so this impacts everything. I'm not gonna go into much more detail about this, just wanna show you how these are kind of polarities, the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, a lot of people in this day and age have their sympathetic fight or flight or freeze response. That side of the autonomic nervous system is too much engaged. And when you have chronic stress, this is a, this is a problem. The good thing they've discovered with all the years of experiments with heart math is that we can actually learn simple techniques to activate a heart coherence. So it turns out the emotions, simple emotions impact your autonomic nervous systems, subtle, thoughts and emotions impact the ANS. And of course, the autonomic nervous system is interacting with all these other important systems, such as your digestion, your cardiovascular, your immune system, and your hormonal system. So imagine if your autonomic nerve system is out of kilter because you're in a state of incoherence. This is measurable with certain parameters of the heart. This literally affects your digestion, your heart, your immune system, your hormonal system, so pretty much all the important systems. So we know from all this research that negativity creates disorder and imbalance in the ANS. We can see this in these beautiful graphs, which I'm about to show, and positive heart-centered emotions create a kind of order and balance. And so this leads to enhanced immunity and hormonal balance, and the brain function, very important, is that you're 
cognition is enhanced, you can think more clearly, you can make decisions more easily, because your brain will become synchronized with your heart, a coherent heart leads to a coherent brain, because the heart is a major important biological resonator. So here's how the ANS and heart interact, the autonomic nervous system actually controls much of these visceral functions the heart itself, gastrointestinal, uh, the glandulature, the glands. And so we have something called heart rate variability, which I just alluded to very briefly in session one. This is a parameter where you're able to measure moment to moment changes in heart rate. So there are these natural variations in the heart rhythm, which we have something like 10 cycles per minute, where your heart rate is going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down. It happens around 10 cycles per minute. And when it's coherent, you will see this beautiful wave. And when it's incoherent, it's literally a fight between your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So mastering this, mastering your heart coherence, and helping to align and harmonize both branches of your autonomic nervous system has massive implications for the rest of your body. As it says in point three, normal heart rate variability is the net effect of these two systems interacting, the para and the and the sympathetic. Okay, so there's like one graph where you can see the times between each of the heartbeats is slightly different. You've got 0 0.859, 0 0.793, 0 0.726, right? And that uh, reflects a different uh, BPM, beats per minute, right? So when you've got a longer time between beats, you've got a lower BPM. And so you can see there's, there's kind of an inverse relationship there. 0.726 seconds and you've got 83 BPM. So less time in between the pulses, higher BPM. So this is a cycle that's going on continually when you're breathing, depending how calm you are, that variability will change and the amplitude as we'll see shortly. So heart rate variability is one of the pr prominent main indicators of autonomic nervous system function. There are others. That's one of the main ones that used by the Institute of Heart Math and physiological coherence. So ANS function and physiological coherence, those two. Here is a version of a graph that's been shared many times. It shows at the top frustration and at the bottom appreciation. So you can see how smooth that curve is at the bottom. And notice what it says at the right of the appreciation curve this amplitude decreases with age and or chronic stress. So a healthy heart rate variability curve will be smooth, but it'll also have a, a large amplitude. So in other words, the changes between sort of your average heartbeat and the highs and the lows will be like a larger amplitude, if that makes sense. And the amplitude is reflected by that arrow on the right. And then you see with the frustration, fear, nervousness, these kinds of stressful emotions create just a mess. You see this jagged thing up there. And what it's essentially saying is your para and your sympathetic ain't working very well together. They're not in harmony. And guess what? When those two are not in harmony, because your ANS is not in balance, it affects all these systems, the digestion, the immune system, and so forth, the hormonal balance. So heart coherence established through balancing both these two systems, which I've been talking about and building up towards. Here's a nicer graph of what I showed earlier, a nice colorful graph. And heart rate BPMs on the left, you can notice that you see it going from about 60 all the way to 90. We see the frustration side of that. And then we see the appreciation. I think this is an actual example of someone who's in a state of stress and then they implement one of the heart math techniques. After a period of time, a few minutes, they're able to create that very harmonious state of heart coherence, which you see in that very smooth curve. That it oscillates, large amplitude, but again, it's, it's like a sine wave curve. It's not very precise like a sine wave curve, but it's, it's kind of in that direction. So that's what we're going for, and it's just a matter of emotional self-regulation, right? Can you become the master of your own emotions? Because your heart is actually the master biological resonator in your body. It's the most powerful organ. It's much more than a machine that pumps blood. That's what um, in the medical system, 
uh, it's considered just kind of this amazing machine that just pumps blood and so forth and keeps you alive. But there's so much more to it, as we know from heart math. Okay, notice at the bottom it says quick coherence. I did a version of that in session one. Quick coherence is sort of a quick technique that the Heart Math Institute has come up with in order to you know, show people how to get in that state. And they also use it in their experiments. So you see here three different parameters, physiological parameters that they're working with and measuring the respiration, the heart rate variability, as I mentioned, and the blood pressure rhythm. So notice up until the point of that quick coherence technique, you see very jagged curves, very jagged graphs in all three, respiration, heart rate, variability, and blood pressure rhythms. And then we slow down. We do the heart coherence technique, whatever technique. This one was the quick coherence, very simple to do. And in a matter of very short time, you see these very harmonious looking curves in all three parameters. So it's really quite simple, anybody can do this. And it works, they've been testing this for several decades. Here's another one that describes and demonstrates the head, heart entrainment. In spiritual circles, we, we hear a lot about blending mind and heart, thinking and emotions, aligning your heart with your brain, heart brain or heart mind connection. And sure enough, um, when the heart is in a coherent state, so is your brain. But it is showing heart rate variability on the top and brain wave. Okay, so it's actually showing a coherence there. What's really pointing out that is the, is a direct alignment and connection between those two at the same time. That's why they're superimposed one on top of the other. So we see, you see heart rate at the top and we see brain waves in micro volts at the bottom graph. You can imagine if this is good for your brain, then it's going to affect your cognition, your thinking, your reaction time, your focus. And that's what they found with math proficiency and reading proficiency. You get a significant increase, 35% with math, 14% with reading, after people engage in heart math training. So definite benefits to cognition, decision-making, reaction time, focus, concentration, clear thinking, all of those good things. I'm going to take a pause, let you digest that. And we'll see if we can slow down a little bit. So we have here four different ways in which they've discovered that the heart and brain communicate, and that the, the heart communicates with the rest of the body. So we've got neuro, neurological, we've got biochemical, and we've got biophysical, and we've got electromagnetic. So I'm going to flesh those out in a little bit more detail. Now, of course, we know quite a bit about neurology from the brain. And what's interesting is this is one of the ways in which the heart and brain have communicating with one another, this form of neurological communication. And so the heart brain is this little tiny brain in your heart. It's got at least 40,000 neurons. It's also got support cells. It's got proteins and neurotransmitters, all the things that you find in, in the head brain. So in a sense, your heart brain can learn, can remember, can sense and feel. And the heart brain also senses hormone rate and pressure info and translate into neurological impulses. So you've got hormonal processes, you've got heart rate, you've got blood pressure information, and this all gets translated into neurological impulses that your brain can understand and which are internally processed. So these neural impulses are sent to the brain via vagus nerve and spinal column and so forth. You've also got neural impulses from the heart which have a regulatory influence on the autonomic nervous system. And these signals flow from the brain to the heart, the blood vessels, the organs and so forth. So it's quite intricate, but that in a nutshell is the neurological communication. Neurons, support cells, proteins, glial cells, all that kind of stuff. We have versions of that in the little brain and the heart. Now, the second form of communication between the heart and the brain, this is biochemistry, this is biochemical communication. 1983, something very interesting discovered, they classified the heart as actually part of the hormonal system. It wasn't just the heart doing its thing, it's part of the rest of the hormonal system, right? We have all this series of network of glands in the body, right? You know, the pituitary, 
the thyroid, the parathyroid, the pineal, pancreas, and so forth. There's all these different glands that release hormones. They're very important. There's this one very important hormone, the atrial natriuretic factor, if you see in point two, A and F. And this is a hormone that does a lot of important things. It regulates blood pressure. It regulates body fluid retention and also electrolyte homeostasis. So this is something that we find in the heart. And so these are all important processes. And it is considered the balance hormone. That's how important it is. It's point three, the balance hormone, because it exerts such wide effects in different systems, the blood vessels, the kidneys, the adrenals. 60,000 kilometers of vasculature in the body. And so this balance hormone is impacting your blood vessels and the kidneys, which do very important filtering the fluids and so forth. And so the heart synthesizes two quite well-known neurotransmitters, dopamine, neuroadrenaline, and they help to mediate emotion in the brain. Of course, there are others which impact our emotions. We know of GABA and we know of serotonin. So this one is the third form of communication, right? We have these bi-directional communications between the heart and the brain and the heart and the rest of the body. So this one's interesting, biophysical communication. What does that mean exactly? We know that the, there are properties like blood pressure and heart rate, but there's actually more to the rhythms of the heart. So in essence, there's sort of the, the secret language uh, employed by the heart that's a rhythmic language. Think of, think of music. And rhythm is one of the three most important properties of music, you could say. Melody, harmony, rhythm, right? It's like the bedrock. It's like the driving force. It's what moves music. And in a similar way, the rhythm is one of those very important modalities of communicating with the rest of the body. And so the heart generates these so-called blood pressure waves that they travel through the arteries actually faster than the blood flow so they travel very rapidly through the arteries and this is like again a form of communication for us the body and there's this resonance complex resonance between the rhythms of the blood the blood pressure waves the respiration and the autonomic nervous system rhythms so all these things are working together this is again one of the one of the language modalities, in addition to neurology, electrical signals, in addition to hormones and neurotransmitters, you've got this biophysical rhythmic form of communication that the heart uses to communicate uh, to the cells and the organs in the body. And it impacts the respiration and the autonomic nervous system. So what they found is they have these blood pressure waves, these patterns, represents its own biophysical language and they're still sorting out how exactly that works but it is a very important way which the heart is communicating with the rest of the body and so literally the cells of your body and your body's glands and the organs of your body they can sort of feel they can detect they respond to this particular rhythmic language from the heart isn't that fascinating it's a rhythmic language and it's over and above the numbers associated with blood pressure and heart rate. So I really want to emphasize that. The fourth one is electromagnetic communication. I think this one is the least understood, at least in terms of uh, a modality of communication, but it's a very important one. And you see there this toroidal field that emanates from the heart, which can be expanded. We have things like that in the brain, but the one in the heart is much greater, much bigger. This is another language, a modality used by the brain and in the brain to communicate with the rest of the body. I'm not going to go into more on that, but this, this is an important link when we start to get into the Global Coherence Initiative and the idea of sending out ripples from human hearts. When masses of people expand their heart coherent field and that sends out a ripple and it literally impacts the Earth's magnetic field. So there is an important connection to how we could explain how on earth can people physically separate affect the earth's fields. Well, this is one way in which it could happen. Uh, one of the most obvious ways in which it could happen, which is this electromagnetic communication, your heart's toroidal field, and there are fields around the earth, the ionosphere, 
we have the Schumann resonance and things of that nature and its frequencies and magnetic pulses and field effects. So I'm going to go over a few practices and then uh, we'll go to Q&A and we'll talk about next steps for session three. So last time what I did is I demonstrated the quick coherence technique. I did sort of my own version of that and I did a guided heart meditation for those of you that were here. It, it really does work very quickly, but there are all sorts of other techniques. We'll get into the heart math stuff toward the end. We won't have time to demo those, but I wanna talk about there's other ways to sort of open your heart to get in a state of presence, stillness, slowness, serenity. So breath is very important in yogic traditions, meditation traditions. Here's a few different breath techniques. If you've ever been to a, a beginner yoga class, you have ocean sounding breath. They call that ocean sounding breath. They kind of constrict your throat. You've got this heavy breathing sound going. It really is calming. And it's a way to set the space for your body to do yoga. And then alternate nostril breathing, for those of you familiar with that, alternate nostril breath is aniloma veloma. It's also called that. And you can do kind of a double exhale to inhale, a four eight sequence. And you're literally breathing through one nostril and breathing out the other and alternating and sort of activating each side of your body and each side of your brain. And there's different channels. So in yoga traditions, we have like a sun side and a moon side, a moon channel and a sun channel. Or you can think of it as masculine, feminine, and so forth. And then we've got this interesting sequence from Dr. Andrew Weil. The 478 sequence, which he's recommended for reducing anxiety and panic and sleeping better. And essentially, you just breathe in through your nostrils to a count of four. You hold for a count of seven, and then you breathe out through your mouth through a count of eight. You make this wishing sound. So what you're doing uh, to do the full exercise is you, you get your tongue on the roof of your mouth just behind the hard palate. So while you're breathing in, you would have your tongue just behind the hard palate. You would breathe into a count of four through the nostrils. You would hold for a count of seven. And then through a count of eight, you'll be breathing out through your mouth. So and this is said to be able to reduce extreme anxiety, panic, and help you get to sleep quicker. And you will do, say, four cycles of that. So it doesn't take very long. You do four cycles of what I just said. So music is a, a big thing for me, and I taught about musical medicine. So just listening to uplifting music is, of course, a way to change your, your brain states and your heart states and really quickly impact your whole body. Singing, uplifting music, listening to your favorite musical genres, and brainwave entrainment audios have become very big in this whole demographic, this whole area of using music and sound as a healer. They know quite a bit about uh, which sounds and pulses will activate brain rhythms. So vocal toning, this is also another big area, just the power, healing power of your voice. Some of the most calming sounds you can do, humming, just simple humming, that will slow you down very quickly. And the famous OM or AUM, just chanting OM for a few minutes. This is a way to increase coherence. And the AH sound, Take a deep breath in and exhale. Ah, and you can just really extend that. You do that for a few minutes. It's a really a heart centered sound with vocal toning, the ah sound. So humming, om, and ah. Time and nature, of course, they have something called, uh, what do they call it, force bathing in Japan. We know that negative ions are really good for the brain, they're good for the body, they're good for the energy field. You feel really kind of immediately calm when you go next to waterfalls or moving rivers or trees or being near a mountain right there's there's like a, almost an immediate healing effect it slows you down it helps you to be more present so what better way to slow down activate heart coherence is to go somewhere in nature go to a park go near a body of water and just breathe it all in and then you can do your your quick coherence technique while you're in nature to even amplify the effects so escaping from the so-called busy city vibes, I, I know it's a very big difference when I come out to my home in the country versus being in the city. It's just wonderful. So now, interestingly enough, with the pandemic situation, a lot of people are kind of forced to be in lockdown, to be at home. So they're doing kind of 
a lot of outdoor things, cycling, playing road hockey. I see people out walking their dogs and doing all sorts of things and just spending more time with family and friends, just really slowing down. That's been one of the positive benefits of this quite challenging situation worldwide. Affirmations, that's a biggie. We can think of people like Wayne Dyer. This idea of affirmations has been around for decades now. Reciting positive information, whatever sort of lights you up, uh, uplifts you, uh, opens your heart, makes you feel positive, you know, sort of alleviates doubts and worries you may have. Chanting mantras. We could do a whole thing on Sanskrit mantras. I have taught on this topic too. Sanskrit mantras or whatever mantras. You can make up your own mantra. You can use this ancient uh, language called Sanskrit that has certain mathematical properties. And uh, the mantras have energy properties to them, literally impacting your chakra energy system. Before going to bed, very good to read poetry, read spiritual texts, read something that's uplifting, because this will impact your sleep and probably your dream state. That's what my, my yoga teacher used to say when I studied yoga teacher training. Watch what you pay attention to in the morning when you wake up and when you go to bed. Do you have beautiful pictures up? on your wall that you see when you go to bed, when you get up? Are you reading positive, lighthearted material before you go to bed? Things like that. Just a reminder, giving. This is a hard opening quality, giving. It feels good to give. Now giving means opening the door for someone, waving, smiling, paying it forward, sharing laughter. Laughter is so good for your immune system. Laughter is best medicine, as they say. But just let's bring in that that small town feel, that small village feel, and just wave and smile to everybody you see, complete strangers, people in the street, something that would be unheard of in a place like a New York, and probably Toronto. That's something that's so easy to do, and that's, that will sort of bring you in a state throughout the day rather than just you know sitting for your 20 minute slot and doing heart coherence. You can be in a pretty coherent state throughout the day by just remembering these many tools that are at our disposal. Tai Chi. I learned uh, a form of Tai Chi many years ago, a short form, 40 moves. And I remember how relaxing it was. When it became automated, it was just in my body. And my body just knew what to do. So good for the spine, for aligning the spine. So good for slowing you down. You just automatically slow down. You automatically become present. You're one with your body and your energy field. If anybody's ever done Tai Chi, you know what I'm talking about. There's short forms and there's long forms over 100 moves, maybe 108. Uh, this short form that I learned, I used to do twice a day. It takes a long time to learn it, but when you learn it well, it's, it's like a gift to give to yourself, Tai Chi. Take a Tai Chi class when you're able to. It's not something so easy to do online, I would suggest, although Perhaps you could, you could be following someone or follow a video and just learn some moves by following a course online or digging something up on YouTube. Everything's there, right? And then tapping for people that are familiar with EFT, emotional freedom technique, tapping Gary Craig, these people that have originated this technique and it's turned into this um, generic tapping techniques. There's tapping summits, Nick Ortner from Hay House, this is a whole area in itself where you're looking at psycho neuroimmunology, right? You're blending the neurology, the psychology, the immune system function, the energy systems, and we can really quickly remove traumatic energies and both psychological and energetic that have sort of digested into our cells and digested into our energy fields, right? And so it's not just for people with PTSD, although this works very well for that. We can look at any type of stressful drama or trauma that have been embedded in our cells and in our, in our being. At some level, it's there spiritually. It's embedded in subconscious programs. It's embedded in neurological pathways. It repeats. So really, when we have any kind of a traumatic stress, even if it's not officially PTSD, tapping is considered really a quick way to deal with that and you know it's been used for so many different things stopping smoking losing weight expanding abundance loving yourself more there's all these hidden programs working right 
uh, within us. And the thing is, we want to clear up as much of that so we can be beacons of light and love for the world right now at this time of pandemic, because to the extent that we can do that, we want to be anchors of love, of emanating this beautiful heart coherence field. And then when we send out intentions in the state of heart coherence, they're more powerful. They emanate in a more pure state rather than sort of letting the mind take over, which can draw us into polarities very quickly. So I'm sure you all know. So tapping is great for balancing the autonomic nervous system, which we talked about earlier, alleviating emotional extremes. Heart math tools, there's the freeze frame tool, the cut through, the quick coherence. I did a demo of something similar to quick coherence on our first session, but there's other more elaborate techniques. The freeze frame is essentially for people that are in a state of stress, like say you get cut off in traffic, someone really triggers you for whatever reason, your partner, you're getting a fight, something just triggers the heck out of your nervous system and you find your thoughts are racing, you're in a state, you lose your sense of being conscious and in the moment. And freeze frame is for that. So HeartMath developed that a long time ago and it really works. It gets people out of that state of fight or flight because when you're in that state, you ignite a sort of chemical cascade, your HPA, HPA axis gets activated hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenals, and so forth. And that just, this is chemical cascade can stay in your body for six hours. So we really want to nip that in the bud, as they say, very quickly. And you can do that with various techniques. But freeze frame is one of those. The cut through is for more longstanding issues. You've got some childhood wound, something that's been sort of hanging in our field for years or decades. And the cut through is more for that. It's more for using your heart as a healing agent, a tool, there we have a beautiful graphic of the heart. We can see the heart, right? The pulses in the background. This is the quick coherence technique that I did a version of last session. For those of you that weren't there and want to know what that is, essentially you're focusing around your heart, placing your attention around the area of your heart, your chest. You place your hand on your chest. You keep your attention on your heart, your chest. And then you start doing the so-called heart breathing. Close your eyes, you can breathe in. Imagine that literally your breath is emanating out in and out of your physical heart. It's coming in through your heart area and out through your heart area. You continue breathing with ease and with flow. You create this flow. And you're finding this inner heart rhythm and it feels really good. And you just stay there for a few minutes. Breathing in and out through the heart, through the nostrils. Hand on the heart if you wish. And then you generate a so-called heart feeling. Uh, a feeling which will generate heart coherence, which is kindness, care, compassion, love, gratitude. Some kind of heart-centered feeling while maintaining this heart focus, while doing this breathing rhythm you know, through your heart. And if you're having a problem, for those that may have a problem, if you're in a state of stress, you're like, oh, I'm not feeling it. I'm not quite feeling the love and gratitude right now. That's okay. Be easy on yourself. Ahimsa. Just recall some uplifting moment recently with your loved one, your partner, your parent, your child. So a memory that was just beautiful. You were out on a retreat, a science retreat, camping. You were laughing. Um, your favorite episode on Netflix, whatever it is that brought you laughter, calmness, peace, bliss. You can recall that. There's a resonance in your field and in your brain and your subconscious that, that will quickly activate those kind of heart-centered emotions if you don't have access as much as you'd like to. So that brings us to the conclusion. There is different devices by HeartMath, these M-Wave devices, there's software, there's a mobile app. So there you see the M-Wave devices. And these things kind of help you to give you biofeedback in real time. You press on that with your thumb, that button, and your heart coherence, you got a green. You're way out of coherence, you get a red. You're in between, you get an amber. And you can literally use this as a feedback mechanism to get into heart coherence very quickly and quicker and quicker. When you get really good at generating coherence, you can actually up-level it and make it more difficult to be coherent, like you get at a more subtle level of coherence. So you can do that with these devices. You can sort of program them and become a master of heart coherence and generating it quickly and getting out of a fight or flight moment quickly. 
They also have them with apps, so you can get it a little bit cheaper for your favorite smart device, an iPhone, an Android device, or an iPad. And you have, you see that little clip, which you can clip on uh, to your ear or your finger, and it's what's measuring your heart rate variability, and it's translating that to information that the app or the device understands, and it quickly tells you, you're green, you're in coherence right now. So very useful. Also, this is a program, more expensive program, that people can get, and it shows all kinds of beautiful graphs and parameters. Greg Brain actually sort of demoed a version of this uh, when he was in Ottawa in 2012, and he literally did an experiment in real time where he had someone, he stressed someone out on stage by making them count backwards in sevens or something like that. And then he had the whole audience beam love and good feelings to that person. And then we saw in real time, the levels of coherence of that person shifted within minutes and you could see on the graph. So he was demoing the software and demoing the fact that when you have an audience or a room full of several hundred people, we can make, we can help to bring coherence with one another. And that's the idea with this project, this so-called peace project that we're uh, launching in the national capital region, the capital of Canada, it is a Canadian heart-centered initiative and peace stands for Planetary Emissaries Awakening Conscious Evolution. Imagine we've got this technology now, we've got the science behind it, we've got a different way of doing this. We do not have to rely on things like transcendental meditation, which are wonderful, but may take years to master and develop. And so the idea is why don't we use this wonderful modern day science from heart math? And I think we can do that, we will do that. And before we sort of roll out the official experiment, uh, in the Ottawa area, we want to do an experiment uh, off the cuff, less constraints, and basically have people meditating at certain times of the day. Please volunteer the time slots that you would like to do if you haven't done so already, either an evening, an early morning, or, you know, a midday kind of thing. And then I'm going to compile as much of that data as I can, and then we're going to select four times of the day. As I said, somewhere around lunchtime, early evening late evening before bed, and then an early morning. So continue feeding me your data, the time slots that you would like. We're going to just sort of constrain a little bit more and say, look, these are the four time slots where we'd like to congregate people during the day. So there'll be more chance of sort of amping up that heart coherent wave and getting to those critical mass numbers that were um, sort of studied well with the TM experiments. That's it in a nutshell. Namaste. Keep putting out good energy in the world. Thank you, my friends, for being here. Okay, take care. Lots of love.